Remember Rent-A-Friend 2000 aka A Bit of Orange? Well, the other day I was feeling kind of lazy and finding a new video to debunk, so I decided to revisit some past channels we've talked about before. And behold, A Bit of Orange is still releasing his Evolution 101 debunk series with the creepy bear. Well, you know how this video is gonna go. But before we begin, I want to shout out my patrons, Fireshard, Alan Morton, JN, and Misfixit for their generous support, along with everyone else on Patreon. This content would not be possible without all of you. Alright, without further ado, let's listen to some squeaky voices. Just remember the stuff presented by this creepy bear is from the Evolution 101 website, written by the Understanding Evolution Team. Commentary by rent -a friend 2000 That's me! Sexual selection. It's clear why sexual selection is so powerful when you consider what happens to the genes of an individual who lives to a ripe old age but never got to mate. <laughs> it looks like they changed the voice of the bear. That's just wonderful. Now we have two annoying voices. No offspring means no genes in the next generation, which means that all of those genes for living to a ripe old age don't get passed on to anyone. That individual's fitness is zero. Non-smoker jocks daily, runs marathons until he's 102, but if he has no kids, fitness is zero. Lazy, mick addicted 800 pound alcoholic who has 16 kids with different daddies and dies at 27, super fit. Maybe we need a different word. Calling that fit seems a tad misleading. I mean, I'm sure you're just joking at this point. The word fit in the context of evolution is not the same as the regular definition of fit. And of course, surely you even know that in science, many words have their own definitions. For example, culture, family, alcohol, secular, stress, salt, etc. These are all words that have quite different meanings in science, and fit is no exception. Here, it is a measurement of passing down your genes. So yes, if you're a healthy individual who lives until 100 but never has kids, your evolutionary fitness is essentially zero. That being said, if anyone wants to increase their fitness, feel free to shoot me a DM. Anyway, it's easy to think that fitness is only measured by the number of offspring, but that's actually not specifically what it measures. Rather, it judges the ability for your genetic material to continue down next generations. It sounds like the same thing, but it really isn't. An organism that has 10 offspring is less fit if all of them die compared to an organism that has one offspring but it lives and reproduces further. Fitness also measures generations after that too, because ultimately what matters is your genes. Your fitness doesn't actually measure you, but rather your genes. So if your offspring continues to have reproductive success, and the generation after that, and so forth, then your genes are fit. Artificial selection. Long before Darwin and Wallace, farmers and breeders were using the idea of selection to cause major changes in the features of their plants and animals over the course of decades. Farmers and breeders allowed only the plants and animals with desirable characteristics to reproduce, causing the evolution of farm stock. This process is called artificial selection, because people, instead of nature, select which organisms get to reproduce. Yes indeed, artificial selection is seen everywhere, from the vegetables you eat to your pet cat. Long before we even knew about natural selection, humans have been breeding things to be better. I mean, even back then, it's easy to know that an offspring of an organism inherits its traits, so it's no doubt that humans would use this to their advantage. First of all, why are we artificial? Shouldn't this be called intelligent selection? Artificial selection is what it should be called if robots did this. Feels like half the points you made so far are just complaining about the word itself rather than what it means, but whatever. Artificial selection makes sense here. I mean, when humans make anything that has a natural counterpart, we call it artificial, like say artificial sugar. So I don't see why this is any different. That being said, it's not like I care at all what it's called, I just go with the flow. If you want to call it intelligent selection, be my guest. Just don't be upset if people don't understand what you mean. This fails to understand what farmers are actually doing. They are selecting traits so that the next generation has those pre-existing traits and not others. This means a net loss of genetic information. No new information has been gained. This is like a magician tossing out all of the black cards. He's more likely to get the red ace he wants, but he hasn't made any new cards. But again, natural and artificial selection doesn't actually care which direction you head in. Even if you are just taking out genetic information, it's still natural or artificial selection. Your complaint is that you don't think natural selection can produce more complex organisms. Regardless of that, this process of farming is still an example of selection, so your point is related but ultimately irrelevant to the segment. What this proves is how much genetic information existed in the naturally occurring kinds so that breeders could make 400 varieties of dog from the starting wolf kind. The breeding potential of the average poodle is arguably less. Wolves and poodles both have 78 chromosomes, sharing about 99% of DNA. So where was the loss here? Can you identify and share with me exactly which genes were lost? 
Look, although losing genetic information is one example of natural selection, it isn't the only method. If you add genetic information, that is also a mechanism, and there are many ways this can happen, such as mutations, translocations, retrotranspositions, which produce new DNA which then gets modified and eventually some will become new genes selected for by natural or artificial selection. It's not a difficult process, and I've never seen any creationist address this before. You just keep claiming that no new genetic information can be created without giving us any sort of proof or address any points we make. Well, now's your chance. You can start with retrotranspositions. Positions. As shown below, farmers have cultivated numerous popular crops from the wild mustard by artificially selecting for certain attributes. These common vegetables were cultivated from forms of wild mustard. This is evolution through artificial selection. <laughs> this is evolution. Just read the subtitles on this picture. Sterility, suppression, and suppression. How is can't do what it used to supposed to be evolution? Isn't there another word for that, like broken? <laughs> That diagram is actually incorrect. For cabbages, it's supposed to be internode length, not intermode length. Anyway, yes, suppressing or deleting something is much easier than introducing something new, especially when it comes to artificial selection. I mean, back when we first grew crops, it's not like anyone had the technology to force add more DNA. And function is not just something genes do. Some of them suppress function. So suppressing the suppressor means you are gaining function. But yeah, if you want an example of artificial selection in which something was added, just take a look at golden rice. A few genes were added into the rice so that it is more nutritious with vitamin vitamin A, including phytoene synthase and phytoene desaturase. This plant was able to prevent many deaths of people who did not have enough of the vitamin in their regular diets. And again, I must emphasize that three genes were introduced. Or how about GMO crops, such as ones resistant to glyphosate-based herbicides, such as Roundup? We can take a look at soybeans that had new DNA introduced to it and now make up the vast majority of our soybean consumption. These are clear examples of artificial selection in which new information was introduced. Please address those, thanks. Consider the facts. We were able to produce a wide range of vegetables by selecting certain traits from a wild plant. This means the traits we selected were already there. I don't want to sound all wacky fundamentalist, but a farmer cannot select something which does not exist. Time for you to address golden rice and GMO crops. Thanks. If I can put a point on it, natural selection cannot be the origin of the species. The species has to already be there in order for nature to select it. Be careful how you use the word origin, because origin of life is a separate topic than the evolution of life. But yeah, anyway, you're just simply wrong here. Again, I recommend searching up retrotransposition as a starting point in getting a better picture of all the mechanisms of evolution. You make the same point every episode, and it's getting a little bit tiring. In both natural and artificial selection, the end result is less genetic information than previously existed. Very simply then, when we look back in time, we see more genetic information and potential diversity than we do now. Ultimately, what matters is the phenotypes. We can't just look at the sheer number of DNA base pairs to judge if there's more function or not. For example, bananas have about 50% more genes than humans do. That is, by your definition, more genetic information. But that's weird, isn't it? Humans have more function. So this goes to show that the number of genetic information does not correlate directly to complexity, which means simpler organisms could very well have more genes but less function. What this means is that even if what you say is true that no new genetic information can be created by nature, that wouldn't conclude that single-celled organisms can't become, say, cabbages. And that's because many genes don't have nearly as impactful of a function, or they are inhibitor of functions, or they are simply silenced most of the time. There's more to this than just correlating the number of genes to phenotype. That being said, your statement is inaccurate and incredibly misleading. When we look back in time through life, we see that organisms are less and less complex, not more genetic information. So you just kind of lied there, but I'm used to that by now. This is the exact opposite of what we would expect to see if evolution were true, but it is exactly what we would expect to see if all living things were intelligently created by God according to their kind, with the expectation that they would be fruitful and multiply. There it is, the punchline. To put a finer point on it, natural and artificial selection are both great evidence to support God's act of creation as described in Genesis, and great evidence against Darwinian evolution. Even if we assume everything you said previously was true, it still doesn't prove Genesis. You'll have to provide evidence that God exists, that he created the world, that he created it in the exact order described in the Bible, and a million of other things. Also, I don't see how you just randomly looped artificial selection into all of this. It's just too silly, what is this shit? Get that garbage out of my face. I'ma whoop your ass so hard that your fitness will be locked in at zero.